Are you going to diss us, Thomas? Is that it? Yeah, I mean, for those of you in the room, uh, we are going to start with Mile. And we go in. <laughs> well, we could. And then uh, Cozy should start. I guess there's no overlap. I'm just looking. So we'll we'll try and transition if we can get through the agenda mm -hmm. a few minutes earlier. But we can go ahead and get started. You want to? Okay. Yeah. So hello everybody, thank you for coming. So it's Mile, Managed Instant Lightweight Exchange. So uh, from today we have a new chair. So uh, Nancy kind, kindly volunteered to be a chair. Thank you very much for joining the co-chairship. So this is a note well. I think you're all familiar with that. So after reading it through, we can go through. This is the agenda. Let me begin with a status update followed by four working group draft and one individual draft. Any other agenda? If not, we want to proceed following this agenda. So first, let me update our status. This is the work we have. We have three working domain. First is a data re representation. Second is a transport. Third is a guidance, guideline. For the data re representation, we already have two RSGs. And we currently have two uh, drafts working on. For the transport, we have two RFCs and two drafts are still work in progress. For the guidance, we have two RFCs and two drafts are still work in progress. And this is a more detailed status. For the IODF piece, we have already completed IETF last call. So after a bit of change, we will be publishing RFC pretty soon, I believe. For the JSON binding, uh, initial version is just submitted as an individual draft. For the transport, for the rolling draft, we completed working group last call, but we have made a big change, so we would have a big discussion today. For the XMPP, uh, now we have got the working group draft for XMPP grid. For the guideline, uh, implementation draft is now finished the last call. And guidance draft, we have finished the writing the content, so we want to agree upon the contents today. So this is a milestone. By November 2016, we want to submit the XMPP grid draft and also Rory draft to IESC by November 2016. And also by December 2016, we want to submit guidance draft to the IESC. That's the plan we have. So if it's okay, we want to move to the first agenda. That is a IODF piece draft. So Roman, could you do a presentation, please? Good morning, everyone. My name is Roman Tanilu. I'm from CERT, and we're going to be talking about uh, IODF, uh, IODF version two here. Next slide. So I misspoke a little bit when we got together in Buenos Aires uh, that this would be the last time we would be talking about it. There's been quite a few uh, updates, and so primarily this is to update you about the rapid sequence of drafts that got published in, in, the, in the last couple of months. So what was the substance of those changes? Uh, just in case you're new to this, IODEF v2 is primarily trying to update uh, RFC 5070, and that's a representation for, uh, for cyber indicators and incident reporting. Is it not on? 
Oh, move it up. Sorry. Is that better? Yes. All right. Sorry about that. Uh, so, uh, as Taki said, the status of the draft is it's been through a number of kind of last calls. So, it's with 80 follow up now. There's one unclear discuss. Since the last time we got together in Buenos Aires, we've had eight revisions, and that was to address working group last call, AD review, Shepherd review, IETF last call, security review, and IESG review. So next slide. So talking through what happened in those eight revisions. So the first thing I wanted to point out is with that gray set of great set of slides. This is something we've been doing for the last kind of two years to point out that there are no new incompatibilities introduced with those uh, recent revisions. So that incompatibility list is what it was last time we talked about. And there's an actual, uh, obviously, a section in the draft that talks about what the, what that full list with some additional explanation. Next slide. So the first thing I wanted to point out is that in the exit, and this is more kind of what is the relationship of this document to other documents. First and foremost, uh, we're deprecating 5070 that was previously in the in the document. What was not in the document was deprecating 6685. So that has been done. And a new addition pulling from 6685 is that there will now be expert review for any namespace registered with IANA that has IODEF in it. And the thinking there is if you have IODEF in your namespace, you're probably an extension. We want to be, we want to have some review about, you know, what extensions might look like just to make sure that they're appropriate to be called IODEF. So that's now in the draft. There's some guidance now about weakening, frankly, how rigorous the parsing needs to be. So two key changes were uh, actually in 5070, one had to reject syntax errors. Now, now the recommendation is just should. There was significant concern about DOSing IANA and doing the download of all those various enumerated tables that, that make those attributes extensible. So now there's, there's language that you know, says that that should be done periodically. And there's a reinforcement to say, you know, in, no, in no world should you dynamically building those schemas from, uh, from those enumerated tables. So some stronger language uh, around the musts and the shits. Next slide, please. The security considerations uh, was completely was completely scrubbed. A lot of new things added. A new section on privacy implications, pointing out in a lot of detail where executable content might be. Uh, there is a, a lot more language related to out of band negotiation. What fields need to be covered in that? And then there was a big discussion that came out of IESG review about how mu how much confidence you should have in the confidence values that are conveyed. And so there's a bit more language, effectively saying, be careful. Confidence probably doesn't mean what you think it is. Really, you know, when you get data, you're going to have to rethink what it is. Don't trust the people that, that sent, sent you that data. So that got put in there. Next slide, please. Uh, there were a couple of new things actually added outright to the data model rather, rather than kind of the interpretation of what was already there. So in the 05 of the IODEF guidance, a couple of errors were pointed out. And so that resulted in a few new attributes and classes getting put in. As part of the privacy review, uh, there is two new, two new things added for addresses. So now there's the ability to convey masked, uh, privacy masked IPv4 and IPv6 addresses. So you don't necessarily have to give a full address kind of anymore or a full block or a prefix. You can mask uh, addresses out with Xs. And then back to this idea of you know, more refinement in how you convey confidence in things. Now, with indicators, now it's possible to, in a very granular way, when you compose you know, IP address with a domain name or other indicators together, you can, at a, at a per blah basis in an indicator, actually convey confidence. So you can say, I have confidence in this first part of the indicator, but not in the second part. So next slide, please. Uh, so that takes us to the end. Uh, you know, I think primarily, if you have questions about what got done, I think we can clarify them here. I think given where we are, I don't think there should be a lot of discussion because we probably can't change so much right now. So any clarifying questions about about any of the revisions that, that got done since last time we got together? Thank you very much for the work. I have one question. Please. It's about uh, Ayana. You said uh, implement the have to change a check the update with the schema. Uh, free, uh, from time to time. That means when we add new value to the IANA table, the person who registers the value have to update the schema. Is that correct? So the way the language was previously written, it would imply that as an IODEF 
parser, you need to be regularly checking the IANA schema in not quite a real-time fashion, but something close to it and dynamically building that schema all the time. What the language now says is something on the order of, hey, vendors make IODEF parsers. When you release new builds of, of, your, uh, of your parser, you should get the new values from IANA, and that may mean that you might have to change your parsing language logic. So it's not very specific about how often you do it, but it's more cautionary. Don't do it often and don't knock over IANA by doing it. Are there other questions? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So next agenda is a rolling draft. So Dave, would you like to come here, please? Uh, good morning. <clears throat> so today I'm going to talk um, briefly about uh, some of the work that we've been doing on on uh, Roly. Uh, I've got a handful of issues uh, to to talk through, um, but before I do that, I wanted to give a a brief conceptual overview of what we've been uh, working on uh, with with Roly. Uh, next slide, please. So, uh, Roly is the resource-oriented lightweight information exchange. I got to update that slide. Um, um, it's effectively a profile of both the the Atom publication protocol uh, and the Atom syndication format. So the publication protocol defines a REST-based approach for retrieving information resources, and the Atom syndication format describes a number of document formats uh, that can be used to describe things like the available resource collections and an individual resource collection or an individual resource that's available within a repository. Uh, so using Atom uh, Pub, uh, Roly allows collections of security information resources to be um, published and discovered by uh, users uh, without having prior information about um, uh, the information that's published to a given repository. Uh, so it allows dynamic discovery of, of, of content. Uh, it provides a mechanism to characterize different types of security information resources uh, using uh, media types, uh, but we've also added some other characterization capabilities, which I'll be talking about shortly. Uh, it creates a system that allows publishers to push their content to a repository, um, and they can do so by providing granular access controls as to who can publish and who can actually see the information that's published. Um, the draft, as it currently stands has been generalized to support a more general security information exchange. It was originally targeted specifically to IODEF exchanges. Um, we've been working to actually uh, open the draft to allow it to support some additional kinds of information exchanges. The idea is that um, Consumers of CSERT information might also need to, to retrieve other kinds of information, like information about vulnerabilities and, and other kinds of things. Uh, there's a lot of overlap between what we're trying to do here in Mile and what we're trying to do in SACM relating to similar kinds of information. So we're trying to generalize the draft in a way that the same transport can basically be used to satisfy um, general information needs. Next slide, please. So the kind of the entry point in a Roly repository is something called a service document, uh, which is a, a type of Atom Pub uh, document. The service document describes a number of workspaces, which are logical collections of resource collections. Um, it has a collection element, which defines an, a, a specific resource collection. Uh, in this case, we have a, a, a resource collection which provides public incident information uh, relating to the organization that's providing it. Um, we've added this new Atom category type, which is information type, um, uh, which um, defines the type of information as being incident. So uh, this is an extension point that we've defined in the new Roly draft, which basically allows you to characterize the type of information that's being provided in a given resource collection. The reason we had to do this is um, Atom Pub was originally developed largely for blogging 
kinds of applications. So there was, um, it was implied that you were basically providing you know, blog kind of information. So we needed some way of actually describing in a more rich way the types of security automation information that was being provided by the repository. So that's what the Atom category element is being used for in part um, in the current Rolly draft. Next slide, please. Um, so this is a, an example of a Rolly feed. Um, so every document type in, in Rolly has an ID. Um, this feed has a, a, an ID element that uniquely identifies the feed. It duplicates the, the category element um, because a client may actually just be seeing the feed for the first time instead of the service document. It really depends on how they're discovering the repository. I mean, every, every document in, in, in AtomPub and Rolly is effectively a, an HTTP resource. So um, links can be passed around uh, to various consumers so they can be accessing a Rolly repository directly through the service document where they discovered it initially or they could be going to a link that someone sent uh, to a feed. Um, so it's important to have this category information, this metadata um, in multiple places. So another aspect of the feed is it provides an updated link or an updated um, time timestamp which indicates the last time content was posted to the feed. Um, it it contains a bunch of link relationships. So um, AtomPub is a stateless uh, protocol, uh, and it uses links, essentially, as a way of identifying state transitions uh, within, within uh, the, the repository. So these links um, provide information like, you know, what URL you would access uh, this, for the self uh, rel would be what URL you would use to access this feed which is probably the one that you use to retrieve it. Um, another, the other link has a rel of service, so this would be the link that you would use to retrieve the service document that's associated with this feed. Um, the link with rel search, as an example, points to a, um, an open search template that can be used uh, to search the feed. So, Chris Anasio, Carnegie Mellon, so I understand that this is just a mock-up and a, you know, but so, the self link is is would that presumably have more information on it so that it's this specific document so that it's still restful or or how it, or is that not in the self link what do you mean by the specific document well so right in in restful every url you you can reproduce the exact document every time with right. the same Right, and so I'm going to presume that just going to provider incidents isn't going to be kind of unique, and then that makes me try and understand what the updated tag is. Right, so technically you could version, you could create a new version of this feed by changing its content, um, which would be a new instance effectively of the feed. So the self-link is intended to point to the specific instance that's being provided at this point in time. So if you made a change, you should be able to use the self-link on this record to get the previous in, in, instance of, of, that, of that, that feed before the change. Um, so you're right. You should be able to do that. This example is a simple mock-up, um, yes. and so it doesn't, it doesn't provide enough distinguishing information to really support that. Good point. Um, next slide, please. Um, so there's an extension um, in, in Rolly or in AtomPub that also allows you to provide uh, paged feeds. So the idea here is that you know feeds may have you know hundreds, thousands of, of, of records, um, which you know could be a lot of data to exchange. Um, generally, uh, Rolly feeds, AtomPub feeds are are ordered in uh, the most recent um, entries that have been posted to the feed. Um, appear first. Uh, so using paging, you can effectively retrieve the first few pages, get you know the most recent information. And then if you're interested in uh, retrieving um, additional historical information um, from the feed, you could actually view um, multiple additional pages. So paging provides a way of breaking up um, the information in a given feed um, over over a number of different pages. 
Uh, so we have some description on how to use paging uh, from Rolly. This is a, 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 new, a new feature that has been recently talked about in the draft. Next slide, please. So this is what a Rolly entry looks like. So this would represent a, a, given, a given resource. Um, in Atom Pub, uh, there's a content element which can work in two ways. You can either um, directly embed the content that you're, you're referencing, um, or you can provide a, a, a link uh, to where the content can, can be retrieved. Uh, we've, we've updated the draft to actually recommend that the content be provided uh, based on a link, um, because if we're dealing with large document models of, of content, um, the amount of data that could be uh, contained in a content element, which is also then embedded in the feed, um, could actually be quite voluminous. Uh, so uh, it's probably more effective to um, provide a link to the content. That way a client can select the content that they're interested in and only download the content that they need. Uh, so that's a new feature in, in, uh, in Rolly. We've also um, added an element called Rolly Format uh, to describe the model that's being, that the content is represented within. And we'll be talking about that a little bit more in a few minutes. Um, and the reason why is because the MIME type itself uh, described on the content element is often not descriptive of, enough to describe the specific model that's being used uh, for the content. So we believe we need some mechanism by which we can provide more metadata. That way the, the client that's retrieving this content would have a better sense of the format of the content before they actually retrieve the content. Next slide, please. So um, I talked briefly about this before. So we built a, an extension system around Rolly. Uh, this is a new capability in the current draft. So we're effectively using an IANA table uh, to allow registrations of different information types to be made. Uh, in the initial Rolly core, there are no information types uh, defined. Um, our plan is to write a series of use case drafts that would describe specific types of, of, of information, uh, which would then make the, the registrations with IANA. Um, so the CSERT content that was originally in the Rolly draft, uh, we're currently working on uh, a second draft that contains all of that original content and basically describes incident and indicator um, information type uh, use cases uh, for for Rolly, so we're hoping to to have that uh, that draft ready um, for the for the next uh, meeting. We were pretty close this time, but we 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 hadn't finished working through the draft, so it wasn't entirely clear how it was being used in the in the context of the updated core yet. So we uh, we didn't publish it for this meeting yet. Um, but that's our first priority, basically, at, at this point in time. Uh, so effectively, what this will allow us to do is, um, you know, through a specification required registry, allow um, new information types to be, you know, created in Rolly over over time. The next slide, please. So um, now I wanted to talk through a handful of issues. Um, the issue numbers uh, correspond to the the issues in the GitHub repository. So if you want to read some additional detail about these issues or comment on the issues. Um, follow the GitHub link that's in the, at the top of the draft and, uh, and, and feel free to comment on those, those issues there. Um, so the first issue we have is um, the, the previous Rolly draft um, included a section that talked about uh, the forward slash uh, resource URL. Um, and it was basically designed to provide compatibility with a RID endpoint. So the idea would be that if um, the organization um, or if, if, if the, the service hosting uh, a Rolly repository um, was, was queried using the forward slash resource, um, that that would either redirect the user to a RID service or you know, provide some resource not available uh, status code. Now, this is very specific to, um, you know, to CSERT and, and, and RID use cases. Uh, we have a couple of options. Uh, 
The first would be to keep it in the Rolly core. Um, the problem with this option is it's um, it's not useful for non-incident, non-IODEF you know use cases of of Rolly, which we expect there to be you know many uh, of those kinds of use cases. We would effectively be requiring additional implementation for all Rolly implementers, even even if they were not interested in you know providing capabilities for the you know for the incident uh, IODEF kind of use case. Um, the other option is to move this requirement to the CSERT use case document. So effectively, if the repository is implementing uh, Rolly for the CSERT use case, then this would be an additional requirement that it would have to, uh, to implement. Um, this would effectively allow um, implementations to be constrained only if they're providing incident data uh, to support this, this RID. Uh, compatibility case. So I'm looking for opinions on whether we should follow A or B or maybe an, another option. Roman Danilio, sir, just to clarify, I'm not going to say I'm smart kind of on the issue, but why couldn't we keep it in Rolly core but make it optional? We could do that. So I guess that would be a C option. Any other opinions? C seems reasonable to me. Do we want to do some kind of? Uh, yeah, I guess. You want us to take a consensus call? We can do that. Um, but so this is Nancy Kim Winget as an individual. What's um, Rowan? What's the difference between A and C? Because I thought C was also to keep it in Rolly. Well, yeah, C would be keeping it in Rolly, but it would be making it uh, a, a May re requirement. Right. I, I thought oh, A was cool. it's a must, and so now ah, if I don't need that use case, I have to write the code. B was it's written up in, in some document, and so like put it in yourself. But I thought perhaps C might be it's in the basic spec, so it's in Rolly core, but it's a should, not a must. So if you need that functionality, you have to build it in, but if you don't need it, you know, your, pro, your implementation so doesn't support it. should that. versus must. Yeah, that's, that's exactly right. Okay. Adam on Phil CIS. Um, so if we keep it in core as optional, then presumably the CSERT doc would make it a must for that use case. It could do that. We could work that out later. Yeah, yeah, I'm, yeah. Just, I'm just trying to think down that path for a second. Okay, so let's do a hum, I guess. Um, yeah, let's do a hum to see if the group uh, also agrees on option C, which is keeping it in core, but as a should, as opposed to a must. So those in favor of that, can you do a hum, please? Yeah, <laughs> that's why I'm going this way. Okay, those not in favor, please hum. Okay, I think that makes it easy. Yeah, it does. Uh, so we'll. Can you ask who has no opinions or no opinions? Yeah, I, I was going to ask if there are any strong objections for us adopting this option or any other opinions. Going once, going twice. Okay, so I think we have guidance. Thank you. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this was that, the actual text. Uh, um, so the must here is will will be replaced with a, a should. Uh, next slide, please. So. Um, Here's another another issue. So um, in Atom, you can have uh, service documents that describe the available collections of the repository. You can each collection has an associated feed document, uh, which contains an enumeration of all of the entries of that feed. Um, I was showing you the example earlier about having a self link um, for an entry, which you could actually then use to point back to a document that describes the entry itself. Um, so, an optional capability of Atom Pub, really the only two documents that it needs to be able to support are our service documents and feed documents. 
an, an alternate um, additional document type that a, a service could provide is a, an entry document. So, you know, for a given entry, um, it could provide a, a resolvable uh, resource. So, um, we're kind of at a crossroads. This was something that was somewhat undefined in the previous Roley draft as to whether there was an expectation that repositories would provide these entry documents, the you know resolvable link for an entry. Um, our proposal is is that we would um, like to support standalone entries because that would provide a mechanism by which you know third parties could pass around links to entry records, um, which I think has some some valuable use. So this proposal would be to um, provide a pointer to the containing um, um, to, to support both the, the entry link as well as to provide a pointer to the containing feed um, from uh, the entry resource um, to point back to the collection that, uh, that the entry uh, was, um, was part of. Um, so we would effectively update section 6.3 uh, to add the collection relationship. Uh, to the available link relationships uh, for an entry. And this would only be the case if the entry is provided as a standalone um, entry document, not as part of a feed. Okay, Adam, um, Adam Montville again. Um, is there ever a case when you'd have to point back or potentially point back to multiple containing feeds? Yeah, so you could multiply instantiate a link relation if, if that's the, the case. There's nothing that prevents that. Um, are folks in favor of of doing this? Any objections to making this change? Chris and Oscar Carnegie Mellon, is it optional to put it in? Well, uh, we were thinking about making it a requirement to provide a, a resource. Because I'm wondering if it might be good to be able to anon you know, share a, a document without necessarily pointing to the repository it came from. I see. So maybe we should drive some discussion on this on the list because there's some complications there. Um, I think I would prefer to take this to the list so we can you know, have a deeper discussion about yeah. that. Your your issues are on GitHub too, right? Yes. So we can bar follow it through both GitHub and the list. Great. Uh, all right. So. So now, uh, when I was showing you the examples of what a, a Roly entry would look like, I had um, I'd shown an example that included the Roly format element, which incidentally we could also call the Roly data model element um, if someone has a has a preference. We've been kind of debating which which name to to, to call it, um, but. It, but effectively, it would provide an indicator of the format used to express the, the content that's being pointed to by a given Adam content entry. Um, the idea would be that it would provide some additional information about the format that, that was being used to include things like a namespace for the, for the data model um, that is that it's it's described using maybe a version of that data model um, if the data model has a, an associated version um, maybe a resource identifier where you could um, find a, a relative schema or you know data model definition that might be parsable in some fashion um, and you know perhaps some type of uh, uh, schema type that would describe the the format of the the, the schema document um, were all ideas that that we've been we've been talking about. Um, unfortunately, there are I couldn't find a mime type um, for um, for these individual schema documents. Um, like uh, XML schema suggests that you use the MIME type of application XML, which um, doesn't differentiate a schema from any other kind of XML document. Um, so that's not terribly useful. So in order for us to do schema type, we would probably have to come up with some other kind of registry or find another kind of registry that exists that does that for us. 
Uh, can you go back? Nancy Cam Winget. So um, I think all the points are well taken. The only question I have is providing the globally unique identifier can be hard. So I think you're going to have to provide guidance as to how to come up with that identifier to yeah. ensure that there's global uniqueness. And you need to define the scope of global. Right, well we have the IETF name, XML namespace registry, but that doesn't help us for other non-XML types. Yes, yeah, so we would have to figure that out. So, um, so what are the thoughts on, on some of these, these questions? Do we, do we need to go to the extent of providing metadata about you know, the format of the, the, the content element? Do you think that that's an important use case? Um, and are, are there specific, we, we're recommending a few different attributes here. Are there specific thoughts on, on each of these attributes? Roman Janilu, sir. I, I like the idea of supporting different types of payloads, and if we do that, we're going to have to describe what those are. So, sounds sounds like a good idea to me. Uh, do we want to go as far as defining, you know, schema and schema types as an uh, as an example? Any thoughts on that? Is there a way not to do it? Because I think you kind of have to. <laughs> Well, I mean, the, the way not to do it is not to do it. Yeah, um, but then then it's just a blob of information, right? And well, you would good still, luck. without without defining a schema, you would still have notionally a namespace which would define some expectation of the data model. So, I don't think a schema is explicitly necessary. If you want to validate that that uh, the information uh, meets that data model expectation, then you would need something like a schema or some data definition expression. Like Boy, CDL. for the cost of adding like a schema pointer, I would think, why would you not do it if you're going to do the rest? So another way we could do it is if we, and I have a follow-up issue on this, if we require that for a given information type that you support um, specific kinds of information formats, we could actually define in the specification or in an IANA registry what the required schema you know, must be, and then we don't have to necessarily declare it here. So th there are alternate ways of, of, of doing that. I, I like I like this, include all of them as required if you do any of them, right? If you put in an unknown one, fill it all out. Roman Danilio, I tend to agree. You probably need to specify both the encoding which would to me would be like it's schema, it's relax ng, potentially something else. A lot of those formats you describe can embed in them then the formatting of what it is. I'm envisioning, and I don't know, I can't give you an example of maybe one of those won't have that. And so it might be nice to give additional guidance about how to parse it. So the encoding of the, the actual content, um, you know, whether it's like UTF-8 as an example. It's wrong that, word, sorry. That can I be didn't, oh. Yeah, sorry, I didn't, I didn't mean encoding as in, yeah, UTF. I mean more like JSON or, you know, maybe CSV. And if I said CSV, how do I tell you which flavor, you know, how to parse the individual fields? And with XML, I can point to kind of something. I'm imagining a format that perhaps natively I can't point uh, to how to parse that. And you're giving me the flexibility to convey all that now. So you, and I kind of like So that. you're suggesting the encoding of the schema. Yeah, uh, that, that's right. Sorry. It, encoding overload a term. Yeah. Uh, in, Sorry, the serialization just for format IO? of the schema. Well, just for IODEF, we're going to have a, a XML and a JSON, right? Well, no, but what, what Roman's talking about here is not the ser serialization format of the content, but the serialization of the data definition, the schema. Exactly. Um, you, can, you can already define the serialization method of the content using the content element and, and the associated mind type. Um, for that, so um, we don't have to do that. But for the schema, we would need to provide some mechanism to declare that. So this is great feedback. Um, so we were going to make namespace required and the rest optional. Um, is everyone okay with with that? Anyone concerned? 
My suggestion is to take it back to the list. Okay. And make sure we get agreement. So I'm presuming this issue is also on the GitHub. It is issue number yeah. three. Great. Cool. Uh, issue number four. Uh, schema for the rolling namespace. So um, if we had this format element, we're going to need to define some kind of schema uh, for uh, for the element. Um, we have created a section as a placeholder for that schema, but we have yet to um, uh, to actually write such a schema. So the big question that we have as far as defining the schema for the rolling namespace and you know to describe the format element is should we use the relax ng compact schema format um, for describing this schema or should we use XML schema in this case? Um, the reason I ask is um, all of the other Atom documents use Relax ng compact syntax. Um, and since this is largely uh, an extension of, of Atom, um, we might want to stay consistent with those underlying specs. Any thoughts? Roman Dinelio, I say consistency with Atom. So Relax ng. Uh, Alex Melnikov with, you know, my egotistic hat on. I think it would make it easier for area directors to review, you know, what you are, ex how you're extending Atom stuff if you are probably in the same format. That's a good point. Thank you. Yeah. Any other comments? All right, great. Uh, data model enumeration. Um, so we've talked about adding this information type extension point um, through an IANA registry. Um, another option is each information type could have an explicit enumeration of the data models that um, can be supported for a given information type. So this would be effectively a way of restricting the list of available information models, or I'm, I'm sorry, the, um, the list of, of possible data models that could be used for a given information type um, to some pre-registered uh, set of, of, of data models. Um, this could help set some expectation um, from a producer consumer perspective on, on what data might be seen in, in a given repository, but it may discourage flexibility, you know, preventing providers from using other models um, that may be appropriate for a given information type over time. Um, so our question is, should information types have explicitly listed data models or should we keep it open-ended and effectively use the format element to describe whatever is being used? Roman? So Roman, did you have a clarifying question? So if we go with the second bullet, which is information types explicitly enumerate, does that precludes the option of extensibility. So we're saying at publication time, whatever's in the list is what's in the list and we can't do anything more? Well, I would guess it would depend on if we made it like a must or a should kind of requirement, uh, whether whether it has to be a value that's in the registry or not. I would generally favor something that's extensible. So, you know, it, so it's easier to add new formats we're not envisioning right now. So you want your, so we basically have a choice as to whether to kind of take an open world assumption or a closed world assumption. You're going for the open, open world. Open world. You know, I would I would say let's register them in an IANA table and you know, we, we, we can extend new formats we're not envisioning now. So we would have a must requirement that would say effectively require registration for it to be used. Yes, probably with the caveat that we might also want to support something private. Yeah. So what happens if I want to use Rolly for a format I don't want to tell everyone else about? And that sounds like we might need more machinery for that, so we should probably talk about it more, see whether there's real interest in doing that. But I would argue something extensible, and I would argue for private things I don't have to tell folks about. So that would be not just in the IAN registry. Any other thoughts? Okay, so uh, we need to work out some of that machinery. So I'll take that to the list as, as well. So uh, work that's left to do, um, 
We've got some work on the security consideration section to do. It's a little anemic uh, right now. Um, we have done a lot to flesh out the IANA consideration section of the draft. It was kind of interesting. The previous draft made it through working group last call, but there was a lot of to-do stubs in the in the IANA considerations section. So it probably didn't get a lot of review. Um, now that's much more fleshed out. Um, we um, still need to finish up the sub-registry um, for IETF params Roly to support the information type category scheme. By doing so, that also sets us up to add other types of category schemes if, if um, any of the use case documents might want to add a new category. Um, so we have some work to do there. The appendix uh, contains a lot of the use case examples that were in the original draft. Um, there's some major inaccuracies um, relative to Adam um, in some of those examples, and they're not entirely consistent with uh, the, the draft at the moment. So there's a lot of cleanup work that needs to be done on, on those use cases. Um, we need to finish doing the work now that we're, we're getting a sense of what needs to be done on Rolly format. Um, so there's, there's um, fairly anemic TLS requirements in the, in the draft. Uh, there's no rationale that explains why you know, mutual authentication is, is needed. Um, so we probably need to, um, to say a little bit more around the, the use of TLS in the draft. Um, there were a lot of mentions of uh, user authentication and authorization requirements in the original um, Rolly draft. Um, there was a specific section that was talking about Xacomol. Um, we're not certain that we want to do specific user authentication <laughs> authorization schemes in this core draft um, because there's a lot of different options that organizations could choose from. Um, one option might be to, um, you know, to do some companion drafts to the core that would talk about how you would use, um, you know, various authentication and authorization schemes uh, with with the core. Um, that's an issue that we plan to take to the list for further discussion. And then finally, um, the original Roly draft used Open Search as a mechanism um, to to support uh, defining search templates um, and allowing for search of uh, the the repository and specific feeds. Um, that was very underspecified in the original uh, draft and and is still somewhat underspecified. So I think we need to explore open search a little bit more and better understand how it's going to be used in this in this case so we've got some work to do uh, there as well uh, next slide please so um, uh, we have currently published revision three of the draft we're definitely looking for feedback um, any reviews on the draft would be appreciated uh, we're actively working on the CSERT use case document um, <laughs> Uh, we're hoping to have that document be um, have a call for working group adoption uh, once we can get a completed version of that draft out there. I mean, it's effectively content that the the working group has previously adopted um, because it was it was moved out of the the, the current draft. Um, so we'd like to get that back um, in front of the the working group. Um, and then we're, there's a number of other extension, uh, use case extension documents that we're thinking about doing uh, for Roly. So uh, one around software management information. Um, it could carry information like SWID tags, something that we're talking a lot about in, in SACM. Um, maybe one for configuration checklist information, like SCAP checklists as an example. Um, and, and then one on vulnerability records for you know, various vulnerability bulletins that, uh, that uh, you know, vendors might publish. Um, those could also be published as a, as a Roly feed. <laughs> so um, those are some of the ideas. Um, we would be happy to collaborate with, um, with anyone interested in these topics on, on writing use cases drafts. So if you're interested in working on one of those topics, um, you know, come 
come talk to us. And that's it. Thank you. So Dave, the priority here is to make sure that we could get the Liberoli draft moving forward. So do you need more review and revision three uh, before you get the next draft? Can you get the next draft out? And the question is by when? Uh, so our milestone is to try and get this. I mean, I'm gonna be the shepherd for this. So the question is, can we meet the November deadline? Yeah, I think that's definitely doable. Okay. Um, well, we, could, we could probably get another but, draft out to talk or to address the, you know, the. It only take us a couple of weeks to get a draft out to address the issues. The question is, we have some discussion to do on the list, so we'll right. We'll probably need a couple of weeks to to talk through those issues. So maybe a month from now, we could have another have draft. another draft. Um, so I'm going to look to Kathleen. We haven't had a lot of review on this. How much should we expect solicit before we can push it forward? So Kathleen Moriarty, um, one thing with this draft, it was well written to begin with. Yeah. Um, so if folks are reading the draft and you think it looks good, we need to know that, right? So could you please at least send to the list, I read the draft, it looks good, uh, so that we know that we're getting reviews and how many people plan to review it would be really helpful to know. So can we get a show of hands of who plans to review it? Mm -hmm. Two, three, four, five, six. Okay. Six reviewers. I got seven on Take, so maybe eight even. So that would be really good if we got that many. We could also reach out to SAC and maybe there would be folks there that would review it as well. So maybe Dave, when you get the new draft out, I can put the notice where you can to sack them to get more reviews. And then depending on the feedback, maybe in the September, Kathleen, we can put out to Mile to see if there are no objections to just move it forward and I can do the write-up. Okay. Great, thank you. I am Nancy Cam Winget again, and I have no slides because I presented the overview of XMPP three times now, and I figured I didn't need to do it again. Um, so I did get some feedback from Taki, thank you. Most of them I consider the feedback to be more, more mainly on the editorial side of, um, and I can try and provide more clarity, Taki, on points like, how would a client find an XMPP server? And in XMPP speak, uh, they talk about topics. The topics could be construed as data models in the context here. Um, so there were kind of the two level of, you could have many topics, okay? Those can also be describable. So I will respond to that in the, email list as well to that feedback and I'll be revving the draft to provide a little better clarity. So that's really the only update I have. The question is whether this is as the individual author would really like to solicit more feedback so that we can move this forward. Chris. We're still in revision zero. But that was when it was in SACM. Okay. I, but, no, I thought I did address, I addressed them there because there was, we were up to revision two in SACM. <laughs> so, Chris and Asya, I mean, I, I read it and reviewed it in, in SACM. I assume there are a handful of others who have done that. So I haven't looked at it in mile because I don't, think that there's been any the only thing changes I did, to review. Right. 
The only change I made from the SACM to the mile shift was I removed the SACM applicability to make the document shorter in hopes that more people would actually read it. So, I mean, if you do updates, happy to review, but. Okay, thanks, Chris. I just wanted to ask one question, Takeshi. Uh, I, maybe it's because of my reading problem, but when I read this draft, I was not finding a word must. So I wonder whether what, would, what you are defining was not so clear to me. So you are showing a lot of example how to use XMPP for the purpose of, of XMPP grid. But if we want to build or uh, implement XMPP grid, what is requirement is not clear to me. So if we could clarify that, that would be helpful for me. Uh, okay, let me rephrase, sorry. Uh, in the draft, you have shown a lot of examples. Yes. But if we take a look at the Rory draft, Rory draft defines some kind of uh, syntax or maybe some kind of way of writing. But in case of this draft, you show example. So I wonder what was defined. So it's just a way of writing. If you could just define what is necessary to implement XMPP draft, that would be helpful for me. Just a comment. So Chris and Asio, and I'm going to try and answer a little bit of your comments, but Nancy, you need to yeah. correct me if I'm wrong. The XMPP grid doesn't define what data it's going to transfer, only a mechanism to coordinate and exchange data. So the, the musts are very limited because of that. So it's really the describing how to use XMPP and the infrastructure to do the coordination and send the messages, whereas the messages are still left as additions to, to XMPP grid. Right, so, and that's spot on. So I, as I'm trying to figure out how to answer Taki, right, the liaison as I understand it is, Mile has adopted the IODEF as the format, and I construe that as the data model or capability. And that's what we were trying, not were, we are trying to describe in the draft is, given that Mile has defined that data model, you can now transport it depending on the requirements of the application. So you can transport it either using a synchronous, meaning a query, or if you need updates on the IODEF information, you could register, meaning subscribe, to get the updates to that information using the PubSub mechanism. So, I mean, and that's where I'm kind of struggling of, I don't know where there would be a must there. I'm looking at Kathleen, right? Um, but I'd be happy to, if there are clarifications that need to be made there, you know, to add text around that too. So Kathleen Moriarty, um, I wouldn't add musts unless they're needed. Um, you know, look for right. specific examples. So Take, if you're reading through and you see a, a section where you think normative language needs to be applied, call out that specific section and then it can be reviewed by Nancy and the working group to decide if that's appropriate because we don't want to sure. put in requirements that aren't necessary. But if they are needed so that we have interoperability, right. then of course we need them. Right. Thank you. So that's really all I had. Yeah, um, can I just ask you everybody, uh, how many people are willing to review that document? Uh, could you raise your hand please? Uh, very good, a lot. Eight people, thank you very much. It's the same. <laughs> all right, thanks. Thank you. So the next presentation agenda is a uh, guidance draft. Hello. Uh, I will present um, the guidance draft. And uh, here's an overview of this uh, presentation. Um, firstly, this draft aims to provide uh, 
guidelines for IODEX implementation. For example, about uh, representation of common security indicators, and uh, also uh, about use cases so far. And uh, first, uh, I will show updates from the previous and uh, 05 draft, and then sh show to do list and then discussion. Next slide. Um, <laughs> this is update from uh, previous draft. Um, update is mainly uh, focus on uh, following IODF V2 schema. Uh, at first, uh, we will update on uh, wording in various sections and uh, uh, to make uh, content clear. And then uh, also update uh, predicate logic section to reflect uh, the latest in KKI expression logic in IODF V2. And finally, uh, we will update uh, sec uh, section to describe the difference between events and indicators. Uh, and uh, also their use in IODF V2. Right. And here is the uh, to-do list. Um, the only uh, the only to do is uh, modifying examples uh, to follow the V2 schema. And uh, almost all of content except that is failed. So uh, we we need review. And uh, okay, uh, could you uh, give me some comments? So actually, maybe you know uh, this document has been standing for more than two years, and actually offline Panos and Mio has been working a lot. And from this version, the content is failed. And sorry, <laughs> and only the schema, uh, only the example is in version one still. So we have to change it to the version two example. But other than that, the content is already completed. So we really would like to get a feedback, please. Uh, Dave Waltzmeyer, do you have a sense of when the update for the appendix would be completed? I think so. Uh, Mio said that he won't, he's waiting for the finalization of the version two. Once the version two is fixed, we instantly want to change the draft uh, example. I see. Because we can start reviewing the rest, but uh, it would be nice to review that as well. OK. Kathleen Moriarty, so IODF V2 is fixed, pretty much. We're just waiting on 1AD to clear, discuss, and I think it's only been a, a time factor. I think it's going to clear pretty easily um, once that AD has time to look at it. So consider it done and proceed, because I, I don't think there's going to be substantial changes. It, okay. There shouldn't at this point. OK, I got it. Thank you. So the action is that we will update the draft uh, just after this meeting and try to send the next vision, revision and asking people to review, then finalize by November. That's what you mean. OK. Yes. So out of curiosity, could you again raise your hands if anybody is willing to review this draft? <laughs> Thank you very much. But more people would be welcome anyway. Thank you. <laughs> Always. Can I just do my presentation? Yeah. Yes. Do you have it? I have it up. Oh, really? Thank you. How about I have it? Oh, okay. Yeah, otherwise, we'd switch to my computer. Yes. <laughs> So let me talk about my slides now. So I'm working on the JSON representation of IODF. 
So now I want to talk about why I want to work for that, and I want to ask you whether this is a good topic for us or not. Yes, please. Uh, yes, next one, please. So this is my view. This is my view of uh, JSON and XML. XML is a structured text. It's very expressive and flexible, but it is very heavy for parsing. Parsing heaviness is a problem for me. And for JSON, JSON is structured data. So it is simple and easy to define the data types and lightweight for parsing. Lightweight parsing is very important for our use case. But this is just my personal view. I'm not asking you whether this is correct or not. But depending on the use cases, the preferred method may differ. Uh, if you want to say um, oh, um, You said it's just your personal opinion, but uh, it's still wrong. Uh, <laughs> um, you, you need to call out your name I, this for is the nice. minute. Uh, like the difference is minor in in some sense uh but of course the do, do you really want to go through that uh no okay yeah so um so the size is different ultimately <laughs> and in one case you have some people so you have schemas for json you have schemas for xml uh but the, the encoding is is just the way you encode the data is different and if you want to add uh our latest bet in the game, uh, which we're going to discuss a little later today in this session, you can add another column for Seaboard. If you want to have not JSON, because JSON is still a little bit bloated, you can have it even smaller than go for Seaboard. Kathleen Moriarty. So the reason they're exploring this is um, that JSON will actually get used more. And that's a reasonable reason to go ahead. Um, if IODF is going to sit there because it's an XML and we change it to JSON and all of a sudden it gets used a heck of a lot more, that's a good reason to go ahead. So and I, I suspect that's what's... Size no, no, about programmer perception tools. Yeah. Thank you very much for the comment. I acknowledge that and I'm looking forward to the next session. <laughs> so, <laughs> so what I want to do is the next slide, please. Uh, Could you press this one? Oh, this one. Yes. Ah, I can't read Japanese, sorry. <laughs> there. <laughs> so what we want to do is uh, uh, we have our use cases. Maybe last year, Mio has shown you our system. We have a darknet sensor system that monitor the traffic coming to the darknet addresses. So we monitor the darknet traffic and try to provide alert automatically. That's what we have as our application. But for that purpose, uh, uh, let me just show you what we have. By clicking on here, we can see the uh, figure of uh, display of the system. Oh. <laughs> Sorry. No, it's OK. Yes. So maybe you have seen this system before. So we have this kind of system. So we are monitoring traffic coming to the document address of our organization. Here we have an office. The packets are coming to the document address of our organization. So they are the indicator, a kind of indicator of malicious activity. So based on the traffic, we analyze and we provide alert automatically. We do not have operator. We just do automatic analysis and send alert to the member organizations. That's what we are doing. Oh. And sorry. It's okay. Really so we have more than 500 uh, uh, organizations using our system. So why not using a standard format? So we want to have a standard format for the alert. And also we want to make the alert usable for the program. We want to let program understand the alert and we want let program take uh, action triage automatically. So for this purpose, XML was not usable for my use cases. So we wanted to have a JSON binding. Oops, sorry. It's okay. So this is our current uh, alert it's in XML. We have an XML alert and also a text description alert. So this is a X XML version. So as you can. As you can see, the red one is a content the time, and also IP address, port number, whatever. The black letters are just a tag. So as you can see, in this message, the contents are so small. So we think this is redundant. Could you go ahead? 
is, is for the text message, we use email. This is much more readable, actually. We are using this kind of text alerting as well. But this is not usable for program. So why don't we have something in between, between XML and also text? That could be JSON or Sibo. By the way, I like Sibo as well. <laughs> yes. This one? Oh, next one? Yes, yes. Okay. One more, please. So, it's so small, I guess, sorry. Yeah, why did it switch? Oh, <laughs> yeah, your computer switched. So currently we are building a JSON binding. So the easiest way to build a JSON is converting uh, from XML directory. It's easy to convert, but we do not want to have a direct conversion. We want to have something more. So this is what we want to do. Of course, we want to maintain compatibility with IO Desk version two. So we want to compatible with IO Desk version two. And also Expressiveness is not increasing because this is just a binding. It's not extend. It's not an extension. It's just a binding. So we want to. We do not want to increase expressiveness, and we also want to consider compatibility with sticks. You know, the latest version of the sticks is using JSON. So why not including that object as well? And we also would like to prepare some tools to cope with uh, issues. So we will provide conversion tool for free. So here. What we want to define more is a facilitation for description. For instance, we want to change the name of the element. For instance, in IODF, we have a port. Port is an array, actually, in the XML. In case of XML, it's easy to understand it's an array because we have a schema. But in case of the uh, JSON, we do not have to use a schema at all. In this case, why don't we have a name like this, port list? The name itself can identify that we are using array. It's easier. And also, we would like to change, we would like to provide some kind of simplified expression. For instance, in case of the XML, uh, in case of the IODF XML, we have a uh, field for address and field for port. But why don't we just combine that by using semicolon? It's easy. Yes. Taki, a quick question on the previous slide. So you said that you're not going to try to increase the, the expressiveness. <coughs> At the same time, you're not going to try to decrease the expressiveness, right? You, you're, you basically want to include all of the same content that can be expressed in, it's just a form. in IODEF. For the increasiveness, I agree. But for the decreasiveness, it could be decreasing. I don't know, because the expressiveness for the JSON is not the same as the XML. So sometimes it could be decreasing. Could, could you say for everything that is done in XML, there should be an equivalent way to do it in JSON? I would try as much as possible. That's all I can say, I guess. So it's going to be a subset, potentially, of the current IODF. Potentially, yes. But uh, so long as using JSON, this, is, this must be the best we can do. So. OK. I'd like to understand that better. <laughs> Thank you. Next. So this is an example. We uh, in the earlier presentation, we uh, we have shown the format of the alert. This is the uh, uh, IODF version to uh, JSON. We created IODF version to in XML, directly converted them into JSON. Then the result is like this. This is far from not good looking. So we want to modify a bit of the place like this. For instance, in XML of the IODF version 2, node is required. That's why if we convert automatically, we will have this kind of place. We want to get rid of that. And also, we have a, a IP address, the type of the IP address and the port number everywhere. It could be just aggre aggregated. So for this purpose, we want to specify some draft on this. That's our motivation. Yeah, so based on that, I have published the first version in the mailing list. So I hope you can review it. And I have three questions actually. First one is I had some difficulty 
to define the contents. Because you know, in case of XML, we have a schema. So it's, it's, it's easy to define. But in case with JSON, I don't know whether we can use a schema for writing a specification, or we have a better way to define some specification. If you know some idea about how to define the data model of the JSON uh, document, I would be appreciated to listen to the opinion. And also, if anybody is interested in helping the work, I'm really happy to co-work with that. Any comments is welcomed. <coughs> okay, so I just proposed to work on the IOLF binding for JSON, but is this really a good topic for us in Mile or not? That's also I wanted to listen. So any comment is really appreciated here or on the mailing list. If the feeling is that to get adoption, JSON is the better format, we should port the data model to JSON. Thank you. So is it too soon? Can we take, and then we'll take it to the list also, but can we take uh, another hum to see if there's interest for us to adopt this as a working group item? Uh-oh, Kathleen's coming up. No, oh, she. <laughs> I, I thought you were like, okay, so um, those who are in favor for adopting this as a working group item, can you please hum? Okay, those who are not in favor, can you please hum? Okay, I think that's pretty clear. Those who have any comments or issues with this? Going once, going twice? Okay, so I will take it to the list to make sure we, we get full consensus there too. Otherwise, for now, I think we have a loose agreement. Thank to you move very us much. Forward. Okay. I think that was our last presentation and then I'll let Taki take the next steps. No, we don't have anything, I guess. This is the end of the presentation. Yeah, but it's just... Um, ah, okay. Okay, so I think in closing, um, the first couple of drafts are ready to move forward. Um, Dave, you're going to rev, and we've got volunteers to review either this one or the next version of the Roly draft, right? And then I will also churn a new version for the XMPP, but please keep the comments coming there too so that we can meet the November um, deadline. And then I'll take to the uh, working group the consensus for adoption for the JSON bindings. Um, I think with that... Well, until we have a document, I'm not sure that it makes sense. The requirements that were already adopted by the working group, so I, I feel like we should be held responsible to actually provide uh, that back as a, as a milestone. First of all, thank you. Uh, Dave Waltermeyer. So, yeah, in, in the process of generalizing Roly, we had to remove some of that content from the core with the intention that we would be providing that back. Since that was already content that was adopted by the working group, I feel like we should be responsible for providing that back. Yeah, I don't uh, remember because I skimmed the draft. Was there content in the Roly draft that you were going to extract and put into the separate? Yes. For the use case? Yes. Okay, so that I can put on, on consensus at the working group too. Um, yeah, I know. The next chair is trying to boot us out. So um, real quick, can I take a hum here? And then I'll also take it to the, the mail list. Can we take a quick hum? Um, are you in favor of pulling out the C-cert use case as a separate document out of the Roly document into a separate one? I know I worded that poorly, but I think you know what I mean. Um, those in favor, can you please hum? Okay, so you want two options? So I can... 
Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, so. Okay, so so let me just since we're running out of time and I'm getting this. Um, there are two options. One option is to pull out the C cert use case as a separate document. So I will call that option one. Option two is to have that content be an appendix of the current Roly document. So I'm just going to do hum for those in favor of one or two. So those in favor of option one, please hum. OK, hard to tell. Option one, Can, option one is separate document. Option two is appendix. So I'm having a hard time with the hum. Is it? Well, OK. Do it again, just make sure. OK, those for separate document, option one, please hum. There's like maybe two or three. Okay. Okay. Those for option two, hum. Up, uh, yeah, for the appendix. No hums. You mean I don't even have to take it to the consensus on the mail? Yeah. Well, I'll just ask to see if there are any objections. Okay, so I'll put it that way. Okay, I think with that, we're done. Thank you. And we'll take stuff, discussions on the mail. Thanks, everyone. So I can... Thank you very Put much. Put these on the email. Yes. Okay. So is it okay if I just write a cyber report on all three minutes? Yes, okay. that would be awesome. And so do you know Charles? I will talk to you. Okay. If you can send us the minutes. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you for doing all the work. Well, you do a lot. Thank you very much. You're really good at communication. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Oh, yeah, blue sheets, please. Who's got the other blue sheet? I do. Oh, <laughs> you didn't look. Yeah.